Угу. Все, работает. Можно начинать. Okay. Well, uh, hi everybody. After some technical problems, we start this lecture, and uh, I would like to discuss today some issues related to work and energy. And uh, first, we will discuss the solution of problem one. Problem one one. Uh, 118 uh, from Iridev. <clears throat> a particle has shifted along some trajectory in the plane xy from point one with radius vector i plus 2j to point characterized by radius vector r2 which is given as 2i minus 3j. During that time, when the particle was moving, uh, the particle was acted upon by certain force, which is given. The vector of force is 3i plus 4j. Find the work performed by the force F if all the coefficients are given in international system. So this is what we have in the statement of this problem and what we must find, the work performed by the force. By definition, you know that work is equal to scalar product of two vectors, vector of the force acting on the particle times vector of particle displacement. And particle displacement in our particular case equals the difference between the two radius vector vectors which define the initial position of the particle and the final position of the particle. So we have some uh, origin of reference frame origin and there is vector R1 And there is vector R2, and the particle moves in this direction. So that delta R plus R1 equals R2. So this is delta R. And during this motion, some force was acting on the particle. Well, some force was acting and therefore there was some work. Scalar product by definition is the modulus of vector of the first vector by the modulus of the second vector by cosine of angle between the vector and the displacement. This the shortest uh, the angle denoting the shortest way to rotate the first vector to the second vector. There is another angle between these two uh, vectors, this one, but this is not the shortest way to rotate first vector to, to the second vector. The shortest way is this one. So this is angle alpha, and this angle should be taken here in the definition of work. Well, certainly we can find uh, the difference between two vectors and the cosine. We can calculate the cosine between vector f, the coordinates of which are given, and 
vector of displacement. We can calculate this cosine using the uh, formulas of analytical geometry, but this would be not the quickest way to solve this problem. The quickest way would be to uh, express the scalar product using the coordinates of these two vectors. I will give you an example. Let vector A be defined as AX unit vector I plus AY uh, unit vector J. And let vector B equal to BX unit vector I plus BY unit vector G. Then the scalar product or a dot product of two vectors will be uh, the product of these two expressions. And if we carry out these calculations, we have to take into account the simple fact that vector i, scalar product of vector i, unit vector i by itself equals the scalar product of j by j and equals one unity. And scalar product of y times j equals zero because these two vectors are perpendicular. So taking into account this simple relationship, we can find that the scalar product is just ax bx plus a y b y. So the scalar product of two vectors can easily be expressed using the coordinates of these vectors. And uh, if we make use of this form, of this formula, we can calculate the work because the work is the scalar product of two vectors and we have to find the ve coordinates of the first vector and multiply by the coordinates of the second vector. So the coordinates of the first vector, the first coordinate is three. And the second vector is the difference between two vectors, R2 minus R1. So we have to take into account the difference of the first coordinate, two minus one, that will be one. So I have written the first term in our formula. The first term, x coordinates of two vectors. x coordinate of vector f is three, and x coordinate of the difference between two vectors is two minus one. Now, plus the first card, uh, the second coordinate of vector f is four, and the difference between two coordinates will be minus three minus two. Minus three and minus two is minus five. So we have three minus 20, which is minus 17. Work is a phys physical quantity, it has uh, dimensions. And uh, we know that all the coordinates are given in international SI system. So in this case, the work will have dimensions of joules. The work is measured in joules in the SI system. So the answer to this problem is just minus 17 joules. That will be the work performed in such a motion which is given in this problem. Why we have obtained minus? Negative work means that the angle between the force vector and the displacement vector is more than 90 degrees. So that cosine, cosine is negative. It means that this force is retarding the motion retarded the motion of the particle. There was a component of the force directed against the displacement. In this case, the work performed will be negative. 
and formal calculation gives us this result, which is reflected, by the way, by this sketch, where all the vectors are shown approximately where they are directed. Any questions? Is everything clear? Okay, let's go to another problem. The second problem will be uh, 125 of the first chapter in Iridov. Uh, so, the first chapter 125. <coughs> A body of mass m, mass m is given, is thrown at an angle to at an angle alpha to the horizontal with the initial velocity v zero. So a body is thrown at some angle to the horizon. And the initial velocity is given, v0. And the angle alpha is given. Find the mean power, find the mean power developed by gravity over the whole time of motion of the body and the instantaneous power of gravity as a function of time. So what we have to find is the power, well, let it be denoted by capital P, power. What is power by definition? Whenever you solve any problem, you have to be absolutely sure that you know the definition of all the terms, all the quantities involved in this problem. If you don't know what does it mean, what, what is the definition of power, you will be unable to solve. In order to solve, you have to know the definition of all quantities. So power, by definition, is the rate of work performance. How much work is performed in the unit time interval? That's just the definition of power. So if we go to a very small time intervals, we will have a derivative dA dt. And the work performed is a function of time. So this is the definition of power. This is not a solution to the problem, it's just the definition. Who performs work here? The force of gravity. We have this body of mass m moving and the force of gravity is directed here, downward, and so this force performs some work. And the result of this work will be acceleration of the particle along the curved line of its trajectory. The result of this form 
the result of this force is the acceleration of the particle. And so this force performs work because there is a force applied to a particle and the particle has some displacement. And so whenever we have a force and displacement, there will be some work performed by this force. If we consider the displacement of this particle during some short period of time, we will find that the displacement, which is directed along the tangent line, can be decomposed into two directions. One direction is horizontal and another direction is vertical. Horizontal direction, horizontal displacement, let's denote it by dx that will be dx, a displacement in horizontal direction along the x-axis. And uh, another component of the displacement will be dy, uh, displacement along vertical axis. We have two axes, x and y. So whatever the, the displacement of this particle is, during a short period of time, we can decompose this displacement into two components, dx and dy. The dx is horizontal displacement and dy is vertical displacement. <clears throat> and the force is directed vertically. It means that the angle between the force and horizontal displacement is 90 degrees. And it means that horizontal displacement uh, the work performed in horizontal direction is zero because horizontal displacement is perpendicular to the force. And the angle, 90 degrees, it means that cosine of this angle is zero. So that the work performed by gravity is zero for horizontal displacement of this particle. And it's certainly non-zero for vertical displacement. And we have to take into account only the vertical uh, displacement of this in this motion. So we continue this formula based on the definition of work this will be the time derivative of work. And work is force multiplied by displacement dr. We can put it in general case as vector dr. The displacement is this vector, the displacement. So force is constant, it doesn't change because it's a force of gravity and gravity is mg. It doesn't change because the uh, height of the motion, height of the trajectory is small as compared to the Earth radius. If, if this body moves, moved uh, far away from Earth, then uh, uh, the free fall acceleration would change, would depend on the height, on the distance from the Earth. But here we consider a motion at low altitudes. We assume that the force of gravity is constant because the acceleration of free fall is constant. And therefore, the first factor here in this scalar product is constant. If it's constant, we don't have to differentiate it. It will be just a factor before the derivative and it will be multiplied as a scalar to the derivative dr dt. A constant factor is just taken out of the derivative sign. It's not differentiated according to the rules of different according to the rules <coughs> uh, of taking a derivative so that will be force f 
And what is dr dt? This is certainly a velocity of the material point by definition of velocity. By definition of velocity, this is a velocity. So velocity is certainly a function of time, and so that will be that will be a power by definition. Power as a function of time, and we have to find this quantity because in this problem we have to determine the instantaneous power. That is the power at any given point of time, at any given mo moment in time. We have to find this function. That's the requirement in our problem. That's the question, one of the questions in our problem. Find the instantaneous power of the force of gravity as a function of time. Well, uh, if we put it in general terms, the velocity as a function of time, at any moment in time, will be equal to the initial velocity vector plus vector of free fall acceleration time multiplied by time. So if we uh, If we want to, to calculate the instantaneous power, we have to, to find the scalar product of the force of gravity, which is mg vector, multiplied by this vector v, which we have found as v0 plus vector g. So uh, this is a scalar product, and we will have to find the scalar product of g initial vector, a vector of initial velocity, plus m scalar product of g by itself, g multiplied by g, and time. Certainly, when a vector is multiplied uh, by a vector, this is just a scalar quantity g squared, because cosine of the angle between these two vectors is unity. The, the angle is zero. And in order to find this product, we have to, rem to remember, we have to recall that, we have to recall that <coughs> vector v, zero, initial velocity, is uh, directed at angle alpha. So we know the components of vector v, zero. We know the components. We know the component along x axis, v, zero, x, and there is a component v0 y. So we may put it in this way, vector g, and vector v0 will be unit vector i directed along x axis times the x component of the velocity plus unit vector j directed vertically times vertical component of initial velocity. Oh, and plus I have forgotten about the second term. The second term will be m g squared t.
And now to calculate this first term, we should know that vector g is directed vertically. So that vector g multiplied by i will give you 0 because unit vector i has horizontal direction and vector g has vertical direction. And these two vectors are perpendicular. And so their uh, scalar product of these two vectors will give you 0. So we don't have to consider the first term here. It will give you 0 after multiplying. And we have to take into account only the second term. And it will give you what? M, G, vector, free fall acceleration, and J have the same direction, vertical. But G looks downward, and vector J looks upward. So the angle between them will be 180 degrees. One vector, one vector looks downward, another vector looks upward. The angle between them is 180 degrees. And cosine of this angle will be minus 1. So that first term will be minus m g v0 y, and plus the second term m g squared t. Certainly we know what is V0, V0Y. We can easily calculate it because we are given in this problem the initial velocity and angle alpha. So it will be sine alpha. Vertical component is expressed as a sine of this angle. So taking this into account, we obtain probably the final expression for the solution of this problem. That will be m g squared t minus the first term is m g v0 sine alpha. Why do I have to express this vertical component using v0 and alpha? Because in order to obtain the answer in any problem, you have to express the final answer only through the quantities which are given in the problem. We have given quantities, the mass, the angle, the initial velocity. So the final answer should contain only the quantities given in the problem statement. If you obtain an answer to a problem which contains some quantities which are not given, then this is not the answer. The answer should contain only the given quantities. Sometimes students solve problems and obtain some answer, maybe very beautiful answer, but it, can say it contains quantities which are unknown, which are not given in the problem. Some, somehow students believe that this is the answer. No, this is not the answer, because it contains unknown quantities. The final answer should contain only the quantities uh, given in the problem. So we have been calculating the power as a function of time. The power performed by the gravity force as a function of time. And uh, we arrived at this final formula. And we can draw a graph to show this function of power as a function of time. When time was zero, at the initial moment of time, when this is zero, we start from some negative value, which is minus m g v0 sine alpha. Some negative initial 
uh, initial uh, value for this quantity. And then S time starts from zero and S time goes and increases. Then the first term will increase and it's positive. So the quantity will increase and go into positive values when the first term becomes larger than the second term, it will become larger at some moment in time, when this formula will give you a zero. At what moment in time will the power be zero? The power of the gravity force. Well, if you equate it to zero and solve this equation, you will find this moment in time, let it be t0, it will be given as the mass will cancel, 1g will cancel, and you will have v0 sine alpha, v0 sine alpha divided by g. At this moment in time, the power of the force of gravity will be zero. What is this moment of time? What is it physically? What's the meaning of this time? At this moment of time, the body will reach the upper point, which is obvious from this formula. Uh, G times T0 will, get, will be given to V0 sin alpha. Yes, that will be the upper point. And at this, mo at this moment of time, the displacement will be only horizontal and no vertical displacement. At very small interval of time, there will be no vertical displacement, only horizontal displacement. And therefore, the work produced by the force of gravity will be zero because the displacement is perpendicular to the force of gravity and the work will be zero. And, and during this small interval of time, the work will be zero, and certainly if we take this zero amount of work and divide by any small interval, you will obtain zero power. So the force of gravity performs zero power, has, has zero power at the upper point of the trajectory. And then the body will fall down. So this is the uh, section of the body motion when the body goes up. And if the body goes up and the force of gravity directed downward, then the work performed is negative and the power is negative. That, that's what we observe here. The power, the instantaneous power is negative and the work performed by the force of gravity is negative. And here, when the body goes down, the work performed by the force of gravity is positive and the power is positive. And then, at some moment in time, the body will reach the ground. At this moment in time, which is 2 T0, it will take the same time for the body to reach the upper point and to go from the upper point down to the ground, the same time. So this time interval equals this time interval. Well, as we started with some <coughs> delay today, let's, let's work without interval. Uh, so this time interval equals to this time interval because uh, it takes the same time for the body to go from the initial point to the upper point and then from the upper point to the ground, backward to the ground. These this are equal time intervals. <clears throat> so here it's important that these two sections are equal and these two triangles are equal. And so the instantaneous power of the force of gravity starts from some negative value and then rises to zero and then increases up to some positive value which is the same as negative in, in modulus. So this positive value for the power will be the same but with some with plus sign. Plus sign mg 
d0 sin alpha. It's the same maximum quantity as the minimum quantity, <coughs> the minimum value. So we have found the answer to one of the questions of this problem, which said, find the instantaneous power as a function of time. We have found it, and we have drawn it and shown it on the sketch, on the graph, how the instantaneous power changes in time. Another question in this problem is, find the mean power of gravity force over the whole time of motion of the body. How to find the mean power? How to find the mean value of anything? For example, what is the mean salary, for example, in a company? You have a company, you have two hundreds of people working there. What is the mean salary? How to find it? You take the salary, the mean salary, let's denote it like this. In order not to look like vector, well, let it be mean salary. It's the salary of the first worker plus the salary of the second worker plus etc plus the salary of worker number n and divide by n. That's the natural formula to calculate the mean salary. How to calculate the mean power during all this uh, motion, the mean, the mean quantity of this function. So how to calculate the mean power? Naturally, we have to divide this time interval into small intervals, into small time intervals, and we have to calculate the power during one small interval. This vertical section is the power at this particular moment of time, and multiply it by the time interval, small time interval dt, and sum up all these quantities and then divide it by the whole time interval just, just like here we divide it by the number of workers. So the general formula will be this one. We divide the interval from first zero mo moment up to the total time in motion, we divide this interval into small, into small time intervals dt and multiply by the power during this very small time interval. The power practically doesn't change, it's practically the same. And then we sum up all these terms and the sum is expressed by integral, integral from initial time zero to final time t, capital T, and then we divide it by the whole time interval time, uh, whole time interval capital T. Just simil similarly to uh, the first formula. That's the general definition of um, mean value of any physical quantity which changes in time. You can calculate in the same way mean velocity or mean temperature or anything, any physical quantity. If you want to, to calculate the mean quantity, you have to use this formula similar formula. And what is this integral if, it can, if it's the sum of such product, the product of power which is denoted by, which is depicted here by vertical section, multiplied by small interval of time. If we multiply the vertical side of this figure by horizontal side, we will obtain the area of this figure. And if we sum up all these areas, 
we will obtain the total area of this figure. The first triangle will have negative area because the power here was negative and the second triangle will have positive area but these two triangles are equal as I told you and so in our particular case in this, in this problem the mean power will be zero because the area of the first triangle equals the area of the second triangle but in the first triangle the area is negative because the power is negative. The vertical component is negative. And to each small element of area here with negative vertical component, you will find similar element with positive vertical component such that these two small areas are equal but opposite in sign. So their sum will give you zero. Any questions? A what, what formula? We, yes, we can integrate this formula, certainly. We can take this formula and, and substitute, substitute this expression for p as a function of time and integrate it mathematically and you will obtain the same result. Certainly, but uh, the physical meaning is very simple. The integral is just the area under the curve, and the area of these two triangles, the areas are the same. So we know beforehand, we know exactly what will be the answer without any integration. But certainly you can take this formula and uh, substitute it here and take the integral according to rules of calculus, and you will obtain the same result. Sometimes it's very useful to see the physical meaning and to predict the result. Because in this particular case, the formula is simple. But there are many, many problems where, when you will find much more complicated formula. Much more complicated. Such complicated formula which will be very difficult to integrate. You may, you may spend days and weeks to, to integrate this formula, but the result is physically clear from some other considerations, from consideration of symmetry, for example. This part of the area equals this part of the area, and they are opposite in sign. So whatever complicated function is here, the result will be zero. It, sometimes it's clear from physical uh, considerations without taking any integral, without integration. And it's very useful because integration may take a lot of time. Sometimes the functions are very difficult, very complicated. So I uh, give you both approaches. We discuss everything here. And as we study physics, I give you physical uh, reasoning behind this integration. <coughs> Any more questions? Uh, these problems are from your assignment, from your home assignment. So when we discuss here some problems, I actually I help you solve your home assignment. And I show you how, you how you should present your solutions with what, what should be the calculations and what should be your reasons and what should be your explanations. So we... <laughs> Uh, is it possible when you're solving the elliptical instantaneous power, is it possible like from the first um, line you just say sin power ultimate to the horizontal component of velocity, or you substitute v0 sine um, theta, and yes. since um, um, g is in the opposite direction, you just put minus gravity and substitute in power, so we don't need the next three steps, we don't really need it. Yes, yes. It, it, you mean that we could we can take into account only vertical? Yes, certainly we, we could have done it, but I have shown you the uh, general solution. How should we treat such problems generally? You take the uh, total vector uh, 
of one component here and a vector of this component, and you use the uh, co vector components and multiply, find a scalar product. Well, this is the general logic, but certainly you, in this particular pro problem, you can ignore the horizontal displacement from the very beginning. Certainly, you can use only vertical displacement. Yes, th that's one of the possible ways to solve this problem, certainly. Okay, if no more questions, then we proceed with problem 129. One twenty nine. A system consists of two springs connected in series. So we immediately draw a sketch the first spring and the second spring. Two springs connected in series and having the stiffness coefficients. So we know the stiffness coefficient k1 here and k2, which are given in the problem. The two springs have stiffness coefficients k1 and k2. Find the minimum work to be performed in order to stretch the system by delta L. So I fix point A, for example, and pull by point B So that probably I must also pull by the central point C so that the system of two springs will elongate by delta L, which is given in the problem. I have to increase the length of these two springs by delta L. And I have to do it in such a way, I have to do it in such a way as to perform the minimum possible work. Find the minimum work to be performed in order to elongate, in order to increase the length of the two spr springs by delta L. So the problem is not to increase the length, but to do it in such a way as to perform the minimum possible work. When we increase the length of the first spring by x, for example, we have to pull this spring by the force F1 equal to K1x. And if we increase the length of the second spring by a factor of y, by some length increment, I would say, length increment y, then we will have to apply force 2 to the second spring, which is given by k2y. What is this formula? What is this? This is just a Hooke's law, which says that in order to elongate, in order to uh, pull the spring, uh, you have to apply force which is proportional to uh, the change of spring length. This is the Hooke's law. And if under these conditions we shift a little bit, change the elongation x and y, then we perform some work the work to perform 
work performed on the first spring will be F1 dx. So this will be an element of work. I would denote it by delta A1. And also we will perform some element of work to elongate the second spring, which will be given by F2 dy. You will often encounter such a symbol, delta, which, which is used alongside with differentials, but the differential has different meaning, and delta differs from differential. And what is the difference? Let's discuss it. It's important. What is a differential of x? It's the x, for example, if it's a function of time, at some time moment minus x of t. If x is a function of time, then the differential is the difference between the final value and initial value of this function. So the differential, differential is always a difference between final and initial values. But if we perform some work is there any initial work or final work? No. There is no initial work and no final work. So if there is no initial and no final work, we cannot find the differential of work as the difference between initial and final values. So in this particular way, in this particular case, we use this symbol delta, delta, which is not final work minus initial work, because there are, no, there, is no, there are no such quantities. There is no initial work and no final work. This is just the increment. This is just a small portion of work. It's better to say a small portion of work, which, is not, which cannot be defined as the differential. The differential is the difference between initial and final quantities. But some portion of work cannot be defined as uh, the difference. So in this case, when there, there, are, there are no initial and final quantities, no initial and final values, in this case we use the symbol delta. You will encounter this symbol many times in many different books, and each time you see delta something, you understand that this is not the difference between initial and final values, but just some portion, small portion of this quantity. Slightly different meaning. So in this particular problem, the total work performed here, the total work, well, some portion of work, will be a portion of work performed to elongate the first spring plus some work which, need, which is needed to elongate the second spring. And uh, this quantity must be minimum possible in this problem. What do we know about x and y? x is the elongation of the first spring and y is the elongation of the second spring so that the total elongation delta L total elongation of both springs, that is the change of distance between points A and B, will be just x plus y. And uh, in order to calculate the total work, we have to integrate this quantity and F1 equals k1 x dx, such an integral will be equal to k1 x squared over 2. And in the same way, the integral here, which will, be, which will give us the total work performed, will be equal to k2 y squared over 2. A well-known formula for the work needed to elongate the spring by x. 
if the stiffness coefficient is k, the well-known formula we discussed, we discussed this formula last semester. So the total work will be given as k1x squared over 2 plus k2y squared over 2. And this total work must be minimum possible. What does it mean if it's minimum possible? Certainly this is just a function of x because y can be expressed using x and the given quantity. y equals delta L minus x. So the total work as a function of x will be k1x squared over 2 plus k2 over 2 times delta L minus x squared. We express elongation of the second spring y using the total elongation of both springs and the elongation of the first spring. Because the sum of elongations x plus y is equal to delta L. And according to the statement of the problem, this quantity, uh, this value should be minimum possible. It should be minimum. We have to find the minimum possible work required to elongate the two springs by delta L. How to find the minimum? This is the function of x, some function of x, and we have to find the minimum value of this function. If you have any function of x, any function, let it be f of x, any function, and if you want to find the minimum, you have to find the derivative of this function with respect to x and equate it to zero. That will be the point of minimum. But the same equation will give you the point of maximum. So if we differentiate this function with respect to x and equate this derivative to zero, we will obtain a condition, an equation, which will allow us to find this quantity x which corresponds to the minimum, and also we will find quantities, uh, also we will find the value of x corresponding to the maximum of this function, if any. Not every function has a maximum. For example, a parabola, parabola has no maximum. It has only the minimum. And the maximum goes to infinity of parabola. <clears throat> so if there is any maximum, we will also find it using the same uh, logic. So according to this logic, we take the derivative dA dx and equate it to zero in order to find the condition for minimum possible work performed. It's easy to differentiate this function with respect to x. Let's find this derivative, which is dA dx. By differentiating it, we find k1x plus k2 delta L minus x. And now we have to differentiate minus x with respect to x. We will obtain minus 1. And all this should be equal to zero, according to our uh, logic of solution. Now from this equation, 
we must find x. So we obtain k1x minus times minus will give us plus k2x and minus k2 delta l and that is zero. It's easy to find x from this equation. It will be k2 delta l divided by k1 plus k2. So, by equating to zero the derivative of work taken with respect to x, we have found the x. In the same way, we can find another, another quantity, y. x is the elongation of the first spring, and y is the elongation of the second spring. So, in the same way, we can find elongation of the second spring. As the two springs are equivalent, no one is better than the other, then the elongation of the second spring will be given by a symmetric formula, k1 delta L k1 plus k2. So we have found elongations of both springs which should be arranged in order to extend the length of both springs by delta L in such a way as to produce the minimum possible work. If we know the extension of the first spring, we can easily find the force needed to apply to the first spring. The force F1 applied to the first spring will be, will be given by this formula, coefficient of stiffness times x. x is known, we have found it. So multiply this formula by k1, and we find k1, k2, delta L divided by k1 plus k2. Also, we can find the force required to elongate the second spring. We need to, in order to find F1 or F2, force applied to the second spring, we have to multiply y by k2, stiffness coefficient of the second spring. So if we multiply this expression by k2, we obtain k1, k2, delta L, divided by k1 plus k2. The force which is needed for the second spring and the force applied to the first spring turn out to be equal. F1 is equal to F2. Look here, expression for the first force and expression for the second force, absolutely the same. So, we have proven the following interesting fact. In order to extend the length of two springs, we have to apply the same force to these springs if we want to produce the minimum possible work. If we want to extend the two springs by minimum work, by producing minimum work, we have to apply the same force here. So we have just to pull we have just to pull at point B and point A in different directions, and uh, the force will be the same. The force applied to both springs will be the same. So when you extend the two springs, the nature is, is uh, the nature governs this process with such laws that this process will naturally be performed by minimum work. You 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 perform minimum work, minimum possible. If you somehow extend the length of these two springs by applying different forces, different, then the work performed will not be minimum. 
it will not be minimum work. It will be some greater work, some larger, not the minimum. Any questions? Is everything clear? Okay. Let's go to another problem. Problem 147. <clears throat> In the reference frame K, two particles travel along the x-axis. One of mass M1, one particle of mass M1, moves at velocity V1, which is vector, ah, along the x-axis. And another particle of mass M2 moves at velocity v2. I will, I will solve this problem in general, in general uh, case. I will not assume that the two particle moves, that both particles move along the same axis. So these two vectors may be, uh, v1 and v2 may be arbitrary vectors. Let's consider it in this way. So let's find the velocity. I will denote it as u. Let's find the velocity u of reference system k prime, some other reference system, in which the cumulative kinetic energy of these particles is minimum. And find this minimum cumulative, uh, cumulative kinetic energy of these particles in the k prime frame. So there is one particle, m1, moving at some velocity v1 and another particle, m2, moving at some velocity, v2. And we have to find the velocity u of some reference frame, some reference frame which is denoted as k prime, and it has some velocity u, such velocity that if both particles are viewed from this reference frame, then the total kinetic energy of these two particles is minimum. If you go to any other reference frame, the total kinetic energy will be larger. It will be larger. In any other reference frame, the total kinetic energy will be larger. But we must find such a reference frame, that is, we must find its velocity, such that the total kinetic energy of two particles is minimum minimum of all other reference frames. Is it clear what we have to do? Okay. So, <clears throat> total kinetic energy. You remember what is kinetic energy? It's mv squared, the kinetic energy of a particle, mv squared divided by two, so the total kinetic energy will be the sum of kinetic energies of two particles, uh, v1 squared over 2 plus m2 v2 squared over 2. If we go to a different reference frame. So this is in our reference frame, in laboratory reference frame. The velocities v1 and v2 are measured with respect to the ground, for example. We stay here on the ground in our laboratory. And so this is the expression for the kinetic energy in a laboratory reference frame. In any other reference frame moving with velocity u with respect to the ground, 
the kinetic energy will be different. Let it be K prime, a different kinetic energy. It will be M1, the velocity of the first particle in the new reference frame will be V1 minus U squared over 2 plus the second mass V2 minus U squared over 2. Why V1 minus U? If V1 is the velocity of a particle in, well, that is the particle, that is the ground reference frame, that is the radius vector of the first particle, and that is the radius vector R capital of the referen new reference frame, then the radius vector of this particle in the new reference frame, R1 prime, a simple triangle, and we can say that R1, R1, R1 equals capital R plus R1 prime. And if you want to find the velocities, we have to put dots here. That is the time derivatives, time derivatives of the corresponding vectors. And that will be the velocity of the particle in the new reference frame. And it's easy to find it. The velocity of a particle in the new reference frame will be the velocity in the first reference frame, R1 dot minus capital R dot. That is the velocity of the reference frame with respect to the ground. And that is the velocity of the particle V1 with respect to the ground. So in order to find the velocity of the particle with respect to the new reference frame, we have to find uh, the difference of velocities. That's what I have written here. So this is the kinetic energy. If it's measured from the new reference frame, and we have to find the minimum possible uh, kinetic energy, we have to find such velocity u at which the k prime, the kinetic energy in the new reference frame will be minimum. So I, in order to do it, I will shift a little bit the velocity u. I will shift a little bit, so the velocity u will be shifted. It will be, I will consider the velocity u plus some small vector du, delta u, so that I will shift this velocity a little bit, and accordingly the kinetic energy will be shifted. And uh, in order to find it, I have to, uh, I have to differentiate it with respect to u, which can be easily done here, m1, v1 minus u. And du, delta u, plus m2, v2 minus u, du. So I give a small shift to vector u and find the corresponding shift a corresponding change in the kinetic energy. This is vector. Note that I actually have to find the minimum value of this function. In order to find the minimum, you already know that we have to find the derivative dk with respect to vector u. But is it possible to divide a quantity by a vector? Is it possible to differentiate with respect to vector? No. We don't know how to divide by vector. We know how to multiply, how to find a scalar product to multiply two vectors. We know how to find a, a, a dot product, and we know how to find a vector product of two vectors. So we know how to multiply vectors, but we don't know how to divide by vector. This is mathematically impossible. Uh, quantity. So I don't divide by delta u. I just find this quantity. I just find the variation of this quantity by delta u. And uh, I know that if kinetic energy was minimum, then its variation must be zero. 
if kinetic energy was minimum, its variation must be zero. Small variation of vector u will give you no change in kinetic energy. And uh, this equation can easily be solved. It gives me m1 v1 minus u plus m2 v2 minus u multiplied by delta u equals to zero. Whatever variation is chosen, this expression must be zero. It means that in square brackets, the expression in the square brackets is equal to zero. The expression in square brackets is equal to zero. And so by solving this e equation, I will obtain m1 v1 plus m2 v2 equals vector u times m1 plus m2. And therefore, I find vector u as m1 v1 plus m2 v2 divided by m1 plus m2. We have determined thus the velocity of a, such a reference frame in which the kinetic energy of two particles will be minimum possible. Minimum in, in the sense that in any other reference frame the kinetic energy would be larger. We have found such a reference frame in which the kinetic energy is minimum minimum among all other reference frames. Note the interesting result. The velocity obtained here is just the velocity of the motion of the center of mass. It's the velocity of the motion of the center of mass of the system of two particles. So <laughs> the center of mass of two particles is just coincides with, with such a reference frame in which the total kinetic energy of two particles is minimum. In any other reference frame, total kinetic energy would be larger. So we have found the solution, we have found the velocity of such reference frame in which the total kinetic energy of two particles is minimal. And this velocity coincides with the velocity of motion of the center of mass. Such is the quality, such is the interesting feature of the center of mass of the system of particles. The center of mass turns out to be connected to such reference frame in which the total kinetic energy of all the particles in this system is minimum. That's an interesting feature, interesting quality of the center of mass. Well, any questions? Is everything clear? Do you understand each small step in the solution of this problem? Why, why don't we take a derivative with respect to vector? It's mathematically impossible. Such, oper such operation is non-defined. Non it cannot be defined in mathematics. So we don't take such a derivative. Instead, we take a variation of this quantity when vector u is varied slightly by, by, uh, by delta u. Vector u is slightly varied by delta u. And that gives us the equation that the uh, factor found in these square brackets must be zero inevitably, because all this equation is zero, whatever delta u you take. So the, the coefficient must be zero. And this gives us the final answer, which coincides with the velocity of the center of mass. So, if everything is clear, let's finish this class on this point. Goodbye, everybody.